Hey, well, good morning. Would you stand with us as we go into a, a last set of worship for our conference? What a great time we've been having in worship and the word and message and application. Come on, let's worship together. Well, Father of kindness, you have poured out grace. You brought me from the ashes. You have filled me with peace. Oh, giver of mercy, you're my help in time of need. Yes, Lord, you are. Lord, I, I can't help but sing. Come on across this room, sing faithful. Oh, faithful you are. Oh, faithful forever you will be. Thank you, God. Oh, faithful you are. Your promises. And all your promises are yes and amen. Yes, Lord. And all your promises are yes and amen. Come on, put your hands together this morning. Sing with me, beautiful Savior. The beautiful Savior, you have brought me near. You pulled me from the ashes. You have broken every curse. Blessed Redeemer, you have set this captive free. Come on, we can't help but sing, declare. Oh, Lord, I, I can't help. Oh, faithful, oh, forever you will be. Oh, faithful, you are. Come on, His promises. Because hey. all your promises are yes and amen. Come on, all His promises. Yeah, all your promises. In your faithfulness and what you've done previously, God, we have faith that you'll do it again. You'll see us through, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh. Come on, sing this with me. We rest in his promises. And I will rest in your promises. My confidence. Come on, and it's what he's done. It's in your faithfulness. And I will rest. My confidence is your faithful. Come on, lift your faith this morning. Come on. And I will rest in your promises. My confidence oh, is your faithfulness. And I will rest in your promises. My confidence.
about you, church, but I'm so excited to be in the presence of the Lord this morning. Let's continue to worship. Let's raise a hallelujah to the heavens this morning. And I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. And I raise a hallelujah. I love this part. Louder than the unbelief. Come on, let's sing that together. And I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. And I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. Come on, let's sing.
It's so wonderful to be here and to have spent this time with you this week. The next song that we're going to sing is called It Is So, and it's a declaration of the promises that God speaks over us and our security of who we are in Him. And as we sing this together, I would love for this to be a moment where we can take whatever words God has spoken over us this week and just hold them before Him and entrust them back to Him. Because we know that he's the one who completes the good work that he started in us, right? He's the only one who can present us faultless before his presence. And it's all because of Jesus. And it's all for the glory of God. Amen. God, we worship you. We thank you for speaking your promises over us, God. God, we give you all glory right now. Yes, God, we honor you.
rest in this moment tonight. In your presence, there's perfect peace. We're reminded of what you've spoken. We're reminded of who you are. What you've done confidence is in your faithfulness. Our confidence is in your faithfulness. Our confidence is in your peace. Our confidence is in your word. Jesus. So God, in this moment, God, we're thankful that we serve a God who works on our behalf. We're thankful that we serve a God who cares and sees and answers our prayers. God, even when we don't see it, even when we don't feel it, in every moment, in every season, you're working for our good. So God, we just soak in this moment. We soak in your presence. In your spirit, God, there is stillness there is peace, there is hope, there's comfort. And God, this morning we're thankful for that. So when all goes wrong around us, God, we can hold confidence in who you are. God, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, that's our desire as believers. Lord, on earth, let it be done as it is in heaven. God, what you've loosed in heaven, let it be loosed on earth. God, as you've spoken the word, God, I just pray right now that, that that is released across this room, online, wherever you're at this morning. The words, the promises that have been spoken to you, God, we release. In your timing, in your will, in your plan, as you work for our good. Can we just sing this old chorus this morning? It says, when the oceans rise, when thunders roar, God, we soar with you. God, I pray that as we go back to our churches, we will soar as we live in our callings, God. Come on, sing this. And when the oceans rise and thunders roar, I will soar with you above the storm. Father, you are king over the flood. And I will be still to know you. Just one more time. And when the oceans rise and thunders roar, I will soar with you above the storm. Father, you are king over the flood. I will be still and know you are God. And I will be still know you are God. I will be still and know you are God. God, so that's our prayer this morning. God, that in the chaos, chaos of our lives, Lord, that we wouldn't rush moments, we wouldn't rush and go ahead of where you're leading us, God, but we would hear your voice. We would hear what you've spoken to us and rest in that. God, let our ears be attentive. Let our minds be open to what you want to download to us this morning. 
through this panel, through this discussion. Uh, Lord, as we just hear from your word and hear from, from fellow believers and brothers in the faith, God. I thank you for our times of worship. I thank you for this conference and what you're doing amongst our fellowship. God, we truly know that our best days are ahead as we put you first and, and are keeping an ear in tune with your spirit. It's what you're leading and guiding us to keep us on mission, God. Lord, let that be, again, on earth as it is in heaven. Let that be done. Let your will be done across our fellowship. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Can we give the Lord a hand this morning? Just thank him for who he is. Thank him for what he's speaking to us. Amen. Amen. Well, before you're seated this morning, would you just give an elbow bump or wave to someone around you as you make your way back to your seats today? Morning, Pendel. Wow, it's it's been an amazing week, and I am just so blessed to be a part of this tribe. And I just want to say thank you for uh, your support of church planning. The offering on Monday night was six thousand five hundred and forty-four dollars. We praise the Lord for that. And um, and here's the grand total. The grand total given towards that project was $27,098.46. So uh, thank you so much. But give the Lord a praise. And uh, again, thank you for your support for Scott Lewis and also Yosef Hoka. And uh, let me also mention at this time that uh, we've got some great workshops that are coming up at 11 o'clock. I've been grateful for those that have led the sessions. Uh, Josh has done a remarkable job with his team leading worship this week. There's a workshop for worship leaders that he's doing in the Delaware room. That's in the dining hall. And so uh, we invite you to be a part of that if that's one of those areas that you'd love to, to talk more about and hear what Josh has to say. In addition to that, we've got from the University of Valley Forge, Professor David Dippold, and he's going to be talking about life after tongues. And that'll be a great comment or a great uh, workshop. And that's going to happen in the Pennsylvania room and also in the dining room area. And we've got also how do we carry the way to ministry and what does that look like? And Keith Evans from Emerge Ministries, uh, he'll be leading that workshop. That's going to happen in the David Center right across from the playground area. And then in the gym, Melissa Falk, another professor from the University of Valley Forge, is going to be leading that one and about how do we have compassionate leadership in a cynical world. And uh, by the way, that was the biggest workshop when we had people sign up. So that says a lot, doesn't it? How many of you think we're living in a pretty cynical world? Uh, but you know what? God has called us with a mission. And this week we talked about what it looks like about being missional. And we're blessed to have with us today some amazing pastors that are what we call missional disruptors. Uh, we have Gary Bellis, and Gary is at Newport Assembly of God, leads some tremendous ministry there. And how long have you pastored there, Gary? 45 years. 45 years. That's pretty amazing. Great job, Gary. <laughs> Faithful there. And Mark Novalis is at City Reach Philly. And uh, Mark, I, I remember we did a church planning assessment with you and Wanda back eight years ago. And you've planted City Reach in Philadelphia and doing a phenomenal job. And you're going to hear from Mark in a few minutes. And then Pastor Don. Pastor Don, when we talked about this session, you talked about being a missional disruptor. Can you share a little bit about what that means? Sure. So um, uh, the, the, the idea of disruption uh, came from a book that I read uh, by Mark DeMays called Disruption repurposing the church to redeem the community. And um, uh, as in all of our reading, you, you have to take a look at the concepts and the underlying theology and unpack that and make sure that the theology is tracking with the theology that we embrace. And so it's, it's easy for us to get off track. And, uh, and, and history teaches us this, that um, uh, churches have often... Uh, used their missional endeavors to the point to where they become 
disrupted by the endeavor and they get off track from their mission. We've got, we've got to be cautious about that. Um, that being said, Jesus said, I'll build my church. What did he say? The gates of hell will not prevail against it. I think DeMaze is taking that idea, and he is saying that the church ought to disrupt what the kingdom of hell is doing. And how often are we the disrupted rather than disrupting? And so we have infighting, and that disrupts us, it distracts us from the from the mission, and not only do we have infighting, but then we have external spiritual forces, spiritual battles that come against us, and they too can distract us. Um, Let me just read a little bit from uh, a portion out of this book. So Jesus himself was a disruptor, DeMaze says. In fact, you might say that he was and remains the disruptor of all disruptors. Think about it. He disrupted darkness and gave us light. He disrupted the law and gave us grace. He disrupted sin and gave us salvation. He disrupted death and gave us life. He disrupted time and gave us eternity. The church needs to get in the mess and straighten it out. You know, we, we follow, we track after God when we see chaos and we bring order. When we see insanity and we introduce common sense. And when we see sin and we bring redemption. And so uh, uh, the the whole Missio Dei, the mission of God, Mm -hmm. you know, Satan came in, disrupted Mm -hmm. what happened. uh, And, and, uh, you know, God creator, man caretaker, that was disrupted. But God got right into it and said, I'm going to be redeemer. Mm -hmm. You're going to be commissional with me. We're going to do this together. And so that's what uh, being missionally disruptive is. It's being disruptive on purpose. We're we're not going out to to create chaos, but we're going out to redeem the chaos and bring redemptive order to it. Boy, I love that. That's really good. And uh, chaos. So Mark Novalis... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know, I was going to go with Gary, but after hearing that, I'm going to go with, with you on this because at the very top, I'm thinking about an article that ran, and back in August, I gave you a call because you became a celebrity. Uh, in fact, China was running this story. So I actually saw it on different feeds and local Philadelphia news, but uh, we have uh, the, they had nine cases of COVID. Uh, from people within your church in Philadelphia, and, uh, and that made the news in Philly. So we're talking, if you Google it, you'll see they sent a drone circling the church and getting video footage. You had helicopters flying by. I mean, it was, it was pretty amazing. They're interviewing you. Yeah, there's Philly Health Department warns of COVID-19 outbreak at Taconi Church. And, uh, you, you know, again, so there were a lot of people coming at you. I mean, you're talking a lot of chaos in the middle of this. How did you turn negative media scrutiny around in the middle of all this? Yeah, initially, we were pretty shocked. <laughs> you know, we had nine. We actually had more than nine, but we'll keep it to nine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now, online audience, please don't, like, share that post. You know, but I would say, first of all, God has just been faithful. He's been more than faithful. Yes. And initially, I'm getting calls. The news is we, were, we had to go to church for rehearsal. And uh, my wife said, we better look decent because there's going to be the, pl- the news will be out there. And I said, they won't be out there. But sure enough, they were there. We had to go in through the back door. And uh, it was interesting. So initially, I took it very personal because you do, right? It's, it's our church. It's the people of our church. And, um, um, and I'm getting calls. And, and everybody wants to interview us. And... and um, I got a little angry. I think that's our initial, the initial feeling. But then the, I just felt the Holy Spirit just kind of tell me, Mark, whenever they come at you or, or my church, it's never, it's ultimately it's against me. Mm. And that put me at ease. And he says, and remember, I never lose. And that put me at more peace. So then I just kind of said, okay, Lord, let's just embrace this and, and love our people and walk our people through this. And, and uh, 
did a, f a few phone interviews, but I, I left that alone and, and um, for the most part. But the big thing that happened was in the midst of this, uh, we start getting connected with other, other organizations, and we ended up doing a COVID testing at the church like three weeks later. So we were able to turn awesome. that around and be missional, and the community was able to come in, and, and God just did some, <laughs> some amazing things. If you kind of just not take it personal, right, and just yeah. let God be God, right? That's awesome. So you take a church that, you know, national publicity within the city that's the COVID church. I mean, the reality is, is that that's, yeah, but now you're the testing site. That is so amazing. Great stuff. Uh, Gary, you know, you've been in your community again for 45 years. And in the last several years, actually, when did you start Bread of Life Outreach? Around 1990. Wow. So it's been a long time you've been working at this. And so can you talk a little bit, we've you know, the Bread of Life Outreach, uh, how many of you benefited from the Bread of Life Outreach in some way? So, yeah, we've got some hands up through here. You partner with different churches and help them to be missional in their communities. But, you know, one of the cautions that we've heard, and we've heard it this week, is the caution about how we become so socially oriented that we experience what we talked about yesterday morning, mission drift. So how do you, how do you use Bread of Outreach in a way that, keeps you centered on the mission, and do you have any stories of people like getting saved, coming to Jesus, that are now disciples as a result of this? I think it starts, good morning everyone, by the way, good morning folks online. Uh, we start out, I think we start out with what's our DNA like in our church culture. So I think if our DNA is redemptive, then all of our ministries would be redemptive. If, if it's not redemptive, then none of our ministries would be redemptive. It would just be a meeting place. So we don't silo our compassion ministry. It's part of the whole. Everyone benefits from, benefits from it. Everyone is participating in it, all the ministries in the church. And so we've reached out beyond the food to uh, we have household products and over-the-counter meds and all kinds of medical devices and uh, all kinds of things that we have. That, and we have gone to almost every agency in the county. I don't think there's an agency in the county we haven't assisted, whether it's children and youth or veterans or, or seniors or whatever. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not much of a dancer. Um, I, I like to slow dance when I dance, and I like to dance with my wife up close and personal because I love her, you know. But, you know, on, on another level, God is, and, and we don't do the Macarena, by the way, because we're at, that, we're at that point in our life where we would lose body parts. I'm just saying. I want to know so, what's going on in Newport, man. It sounds like... <laughs> Sounds like a happening place to be. <laughs> but, but anyway, God's given us the privilege to slow dance with our community over about three decades. Nothing splashy, nothing big. It's just taking the redemptive message along with whatever we're doing. Uh, I talk a lot about spheres of influence. God's placed us in a sphere of influence. Yeah. And, and God wants to use us in that sphere of influence, whatever our occupation is. But what do we serve? We serve to look for those Kairos moments mm -hmm. that God opens a door and, and ministers. That's awesome. Really good. And so, again, the whole question on life change, you said about stories. Yeah. So do you have a story? How many you want? It's good. <laughs> yeah. we, uh, we had a, a, a doc who was not very um, – he, he just loved people more than he loved HIPAA. Let me just say it that way. And, and uh, uh, so he would pass names to me and say, these people are on drugs, know my background, and could you help them? One of the families that got saved through us, we go back door, so we won't get the doc in trouble, but, but uh, led uh, that family to the Lord, and uh, they're the key workers in our Bread of Life Outreach Ministry now. The mom and the daughter are key workers. She's a social worker. We just sent a whole boatload of toys up to help them going into houses with tough situations, to help the kids uh, where there are tense situations. And then also... Um, uh, we had a, uh, a lady, uh, I'm sorry, a man that uh, was receiving food. His wife was blind. They're retired. And we're helping them. I'm befriending them. And he had a heart attack. And so I'm, I'm, I'm taking the boxes to the house now. I'm seeing him as he's recuperating. And uh, I had the privilege to lead him to the Lord. Praise God. The amazing thing. One more. Go ahead. And uh, an ER. This is good. I got a call from someone in an ER, uh, the sister of a woman who was in ER dying, and she said, could you come down and visit at, at the ER? So I did, and there are family members there. The woman had just days to live. Mm. 
And she said, you know, I listened to the messages that I heard from your outreach uh, ministry, and I've never made peace with God. Could you help me with that? Everybody in the room got saved on that day. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Praise God. Isn't that awesome? That's great. And, and let me just mention to our online audience, uh, please don't share the HIPAA violations as well. So He's, uh, he's in heaven now, that doctor. Okay, so I guess he's released from that. Good. He's released. Uh, great. The, uh, <laughs> he's dancing in heaven, right, Gary? But, uh, no HIPAA there. No, no HIPAA there. there. Praise God. So, Pastor Don, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the foundations of your ministry, one of the strengths when you were at Uniontown and New Stanton, was uh, helping people to respond to Christ. You preach a message, and then at the same time, at the end, you know, you would just ask people to come to the Lord. And so, can you talk a little bit about invitations versus altar calls, and and, and maybe even some practical things that we can do? Yeah. So, you know, knowing your context is hugely important. Uh, when we were in Uniontown, our church had a a Bible Belt feel. Oh, I've never pastored in the Bible Belt, but that's how I imagined it was because there was such an openness and a welcoming to the gospel. So uh, giving uh, altar calls, uh, kind of a, a Tommy Barnett, if you really mean business with God, you're going to come down to the altar and meet me here. We're going to pray together. And that was very well embraced and accepted. The culture was so open to that so that uh, it just seemed like weekly we were bringing people to faith in Christ through the altar call. I moved 40 miles north to New Stanton, and I don't know if it was the time 2007, was there a culture shift, or was it the geography uh, that we moved to a different county and, and you know, steel worker kind of a, a, a place and uh, those pieces. And so we, I sensed in my spirit that having people walk the aisle was not as effective as it was 40 miles south. And, and so I had, to, I had to revisit my theology and say, is this essential? If it's essential, it's off the table for discussion. But did Jesus have people walk the aisle? Did Peter and Paul have people walk the aisle? And you know, we, we mentioned this the other night, it wasn't until the 1830s, Charles Finney, that uh, the, the mourner's bench and the, the public de demonstration of making a commitment to Christ, and I thought, you know, does, does it require in that salvation moment, somebody sacrificing their ego. Mm. That's a really steep hill to climb. Mm. And so I, I, I gathered a, an invitation style at a funeral. I was at a funeral, and there was another evangelical pastor doing the funeral. And I learned from him in that moment, because that was not the moment to have people come forward. Right. I mean, the casket's in the way. It's just not the, it's just <laughs> not the moment. And he did this, uh, this invitation where he said, if you want to invite Christ to be your Savior, would you just look at me and make eye contact with me? No hands raised. Mm -hmm. And he said, yeah, good to see you. I'm so glad. You and he, was, he, was, he said, I, I just want to have a quick conversation with you. We're going to pray this prayer. And you pray it in your heart. And Christ will come into your heart. Mm -hmm. And take away your sins. And, 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 and in the quietness of that moment, and I thought, how sensitive. That's context. Yes. And so uh, uh, I borrowed that, and I took that to New Stanton. And, and from that point forward, I had people raise their hand in response. And then afterwards, I'd say, if you raised your hand, would you make eye contact with me? I just want to have a conversation with you right now. Mm. And, and they would. People would look up, and I would just go from face to face and say, we're going to pray this prayer and invite Jesus into your heart. I'd like to connect with you after the service or at some time during the next week and tell you, you know, share with you what next steps there might yeah. be. So let's pray this prayer. And uh, um, as many people were coming to the Lord through that methodology as walking the aisle. Now, is one right and the other wrong? Mm -hmm. No. Is one preferable? And the, it depends on the context. Right. 
Knowing your context makes all the difference in the world. And, and just one other resource, and that's Ray Comfort. I'm a Ray Comfort fan. If you've never listened to Hell's Best Kept Secret, mm -hmm. it should be uh, mandatory listening for every preacher because he just lays out the law and grace. He talks about the Ten Commandments, and uh, then he provides a pathway of grace to salvation, and, and I have used that methodology in large group settings with, I mean, we get responses. At the end of the day, the regeneration is up to the Holy Spirit. Yes. We can only offer and, and give them an invitation yeah. and then endeavor to provide an easy connect with them mm -hmm. so that discipleship can continue after that, after that point. That's great. Good stuff. Thank you. Uh, Mark, talk to us a little bit about missional strategies that have been birthed in the middle of the pandemic. So, you know, I know you have like this huge food pantry that you do and some ministries there, evangelism teams. Talk to us a little bit about what's been birthed in the middle of this. Yeah, for, first of all, <laughs> what, what uh, Pastor Emma was saying um, is so powerful because the context is so vital so I'm not going to do what Gary does, and nor should Gary be doing what I'm doing. And, and that term missional, I heard about 13, 14 years ago for the first time, and it struck me. And I said, oh, when we start our church, we're going to do this and this and this. And we've done some of that just to start. Um, but missional is really just listening to, to the, the voice of the Holy Spirit. What are we supposed to do? Uh, and we've kind of lived that out. We've tried a lot of different things. And so here comes the pandemic. Everybody panics. We're a little bit in, you know, fear. And I realize this is a time, this is an opportunity, that word has been powerful during this time, an opportunity uh, to keep the mission of God going regardless of what's going on because persecution will come and all these things will come, fear, but the, the mission of God never stops. And so we just immediately partnered with a, a large food pantry immediately and we began to help them and deliver food and, and just do those things and it was, it was great. Uh, and then things began to shift Right. And um, and we went to pray. Uh, my wife, uh, our family and um, our, our campus pastor's family, we went to pray. I said, Lord, what are we supposed to do? And we felt the Holy Spirit say, I need you to go hit the streets. I need you to hit the streets. And we're like, but it's a pandemic. <laughs> you know, we're not supposed to be out there. But we just <laughs> and I don't I don't recommend anybody to do it. What is God calling you to do? Right. And and he called us to hit the streets. And I, I, I said, if someone if I saw another church doing that, what are they doing? But we just did something very simple. We just met with some folks who were willing to go out there. We expressed there's a risk here. And we said, we're just going to go connect with people. We're just going to connect. We're not going to our city doesn't necessarily need another preaching or uh, they've, they, they've heard the gospel. They just need to connect. And so we just gave our folks a three day maybe six-hour training on, hey, let's just talk to people. Uh, went to three corners in the city, set up six teams, and, and we just started. We told our folks, hey, you're talking to people. How has the COVID affected you? Just simple questions. And in this conversation, we're, we're telling our folks, just connect with the Holy Spirit. What is the Holy Spirit leading you to do? We taught our people how to say, uh, uh, offer the gospel in a minute, share your testimony in a minute, and or pray for someone. And we've can just go, seen some amazing things. Can you do that one things. more time? Give that to us one more time. That was really sure. Good. We just told our folks, you're out there, you're talking to people in this conversation. If the Holy Spirit gives you an opportunity, uh, you're going to share the gospel in a minute. You're going to share your testimony in a minute. And or you're going to pray for them according to whatever they need prayer for. And our folks, our folks went crazy. <laughs> wow. They just went crazy. We've seen deliverances, healings. We've seen transformation. People get, give their lives to Jesus. And it's not necessarily out there with a bullhorn or giving tracts out. I'm not against any of that. It's just culture changes, and God called us to do it this way right now, and it's not a complicated. It's very simple, and the biggest thing is <laughs> one a brother from another church called me, and he said, he called me. He's like, hey, Pastor, your folks is out here. He said, they're doing it. He said, they're praying for people. He said, it's amazing. He said, you know what the greatest thing about this is? And I said, what? He said, the greatest thing is you're not here. Huh. Wow. And I began to, like, tear up. I was like, wow, I'm not there. We need to empower the preaching last night, right? We need to empower. It's not one star, right? It's a galaxy of stars, a universe of stars. And, and it was so amazing. We don't, every week we have teams out there doing this. And I'll go to the sites, but I'm not leading the sites. That is tremendous. That's great. 
So in the middle of all this, what is God asking you to do? Gary, uh, you launched about a year ago Dinner Church. And so, uh, you know, this whole concept of Dinner Church, can you highlight it? And maybe with that, maybe if somebody would want to start something like that, how would they do that? And what are some of the practicals of it? Okay. Uh, it's basically focusing on the nuns and the dunce, those who have no religious affiliation or those who have given up on church for whatever reason. It's basically set up once a week around a dinner table, and uh, we give a little eight-minute uh, eight message, uh, giving the hope in Jesus, sharing the gospel, uh, usually in unique ways, crazy ways. Um, but anyway, uh, it's – and then – but the key, is a, the key is a conversation around the tables. That's the key. As you get to learn about people's lives, hear their story, then, then you earn the right to speak into their lives at a certain point. Um, just Friday – uh, here, I'm sorry, yesterday here, I, I get a phone call during the service. Later on, I went out, checked my message, and it was a, a, a person that I've been ministering to at dinner table having marriage problems. Guy's not saved. He's calling me and asking for help. You know, so it, but to, to start it up, it's like, I, I, you mentioned the concept probably uh, two years ago. Tom does a fantastic job. I'm telling you, he does an incredible, <laughs> incredible job. And he, he, he sent an email around just mentioning Verlon Fosner's guy's name in Seattle who started this AG guy. And uh, he started, he's got a whole bunch of them now. But that just stuck in me. It resonated in me. And, and you know, if it's there three, four months later, it's probably a God thing, you know. So, um, you know, there's, there's a difference between um, uh, sharing a vision and a shared vision. You know, it's it's getting people together, a sh sharing a vision. You hear something here in a place like this. You go home, put some flesh and flesh on it, spit it out to the congregation, and either people get on board or they get angry, one or the other. A shared vision is where you get 10, 15 people in a room, mm. and and you start talking about this. It took us 10 weeks to put this together, and and by week three, already stuff was leaking out of that room into the congregation. Whoa, what's going on? You know. And by the end of the 10 weeks, we had all kinds of people on board. This, this can be done uh, just simply having a dinner in your neighborhood. If you don't want to do a big room like we're doing, you can do a dinner in a neighborhood. Just befriend a family. Start talking about whatever. And then get topics to introduce. Invite another family in to join you. And before long, you have two, three families. You got something going there. That's tremendous. You know, one of the things that I, I realized when I do church planning assessments is that the people that have made a lot of disciples are people that spent a lot of time eating with people. Maybe that fits that at-large presbyter part. So, uh, but, you know. The, at large ministry, I'm in. At large ministry. So, um, you know, when you look at it, it, when you read the Gospels, you see Jesus was always eating with people. So Gary meets on Thursday nights, and, uh, and so Sunday morning attendance, we're going to talk numbers. Sunday morning attendance at your church is how many? Pre-COVID? Let's deal pre-COVID right now. 230. Okay, what is it running now? Uh, Two-thirds of that. Two-thirds of that, okay. Um, and on Thursday night, pre-COVID, how many were coming out to dinner church? Pre-COVID, buck 58. Okay, and now, like with COVID? We're 130, 140 now, that range. We started people driving through, and then we surveyed. They wanted to come back inside, so we're inside now. It's really interesting. The church percentage is lower than the percentage with the unchurched <laughs> people. So uh, that's kind of interesting. So <laughs> maybe we need to feed more people. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so when you look at it, so if they come in, they come into this, and when they come into the service, what is that, or not service, the, when they come into the dinner table, what does that look like? We exactly. have name tags. Everyone has a name tag, so we get to know who everybody is. I'm just Gary, not Pastor Gary. Everyone has tags. And uh, we have some canned Christian contemporary music playing in the background. And then uh, uh, we have greeters. We have people who are, ah, th what's so great about this is that everyone can participate in, in your church. Yeah. I, I just talked to a lady who is a server, and I talked to her Sunday morning. She was serving coffee Sunday morning at our Sunday church. And, and uh and, and I, I just thanked her and said, man, you do such a great job, you mm. know, serving people. And, you know, her comment was, and she's so shy. She would never, I mean, you never know she's in the room. 
And she said, you know, there's a man that I've been talking to, said this is the only home-cooked meal he ever gets. Wow. Said he's a widower, and, and he's the only home-cooked me meal he ever gets. And we've had such incredible opportunities. But then, then we have a short message, usually based on some crazy YouTube video of some kind, that we work a gospel message into it, some, something insane. And, and then, then we have discussion around the tables, which can zero in on that, can build from that, or it can um, work another direction. And we have materials out for kids, coloring stuff. I find some of the adults do the coloring things as well. But, but we have all these things laid out on the tables, and then we call tables by number to come and, and go through the line. All this time we're talking to people, building relationships. We found you have to belong to believe. Yeah. Now, this is a picture, actually, of your distribution, I think, that we have, of the food distribution. That is our, I think that's a back-to-school thing. A back-to-school thing. So yeah. that's one of the things you do we in your do community. Two of those. Okay. And then there's also a picture somewhere in there of people sitting around a table and eating, and they may throw that's that. That's dinner table. That's dinner table. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. So when we look at that, yeah, praise God for that. How many of those are your people that just came for a free meal on Thursday night? We, oh, we don't allow that. I mean, your Sunday morning people. No, we don't allow that. Okay. No, no. We tell them, if you're coming, you're working. Okay. So check out with us. So about 20 people there are team wow, members. Wow, that's awesome. No, we have fellowship meals other times. This is not a fellowship meal. So I, I just want you to absorb this. This is pretty amazing to me that this is... You know, when you look at what this has been missionally in this community, it's not connecting with the people that are a normal part of our tribe, but it's inviting people to come in and walk in relationship. I remember the story that you're sitting around the table and a person just said to you, Pastor, um, you feel comfortable sharing that one? Go ahead. Yeah. So they're telling me this story about uh, trains. They have trains. Brother and sister living together in an apartment in about their 30s, 40s. And uh, they were talking about trains. They have these train setups. I love this train. So I'm listening about trains and getting to know them. And anyway, so time comes to give the talk. Well, I was giving the talk that night, so I gave a little talk. And then came back down. I came back to the table, sat down. And uh, the woman says, uh, are you a pastor? I said, yeah, yeah, I am. And she said, uh, a couple of sentences later, she said, you know I'm a lesbian? And I said, I'm a heterosexual. Pleased to meet you. <laughs> What, what I love is there's no expectations. There's no, it's just laid back. You love on people, build relationships with people, and, and it just goes. It just goes. It's only been a year, and then we, get, we had a layoff now, so we're getting started back up again. So I can't wait to see what happens because this, we look at this as another church, and we're going to use uh, Dan McNaughton's book, When People Accept Jesus, and walk them through that, you know, the follow book. And um, so it, it, you know, what, where it goes, who knows? I don't know, but it's good. This is great. Gary's got a real heart for evangelism and pastoring people, and it's very apparent. Thank you, Gary. Uh, Pastor Don, you know, we talked about last year here at Thrive, a fivefold ministry gifts. How does fivefold really kind of, how does that match up or fit within the whole missional disruptor piece? Sure. So, um, you know, the fivefold ministry, apostle, prophet, uh, evangelist, pastor, teacher. And uh, most of the time when we've talked about those, we've talked about them as offices rather than functions. And they become titles and then they become distractions. Um, I got an email from somebody overseas and, and it said, uh, uh, brother so-and-so is a super apostle. I didn't even know there was such a thing as, you know, super apostle. And doesn't that just drip ego? What, what is this about? Is, you know, David did such a great job, President Kim last night, talking about, you know, uh, uh, role confusion, but he also talked about our search for significance. And this isn't about us. If we would just park the titles, Gary, you've, you've said it, there are times where you, you, you're identified by your role and your function, and we shouldn't spurn that. That's not a problem, but we don't live for that either. And if you do, then you've really got to get into the prayer closet and do some deep, deep prayer because uh, it becomes a distraction which will disrupt the whole thing. Uh, we have a hundred examples of apostolic opportunity. And uh, it's, it's not just being an apostle, it is 
developing an apostolic team around you so that the gospel can go places that it wasn't going otherwise. We need apostles. We need a hundred of them. And uh, we'll keep, we're, we're going to keep promoting this and, and making folks aware of the opportunities uh, within our own network. There's a hundred opportunities to plant churches. That's an apostolic disruption because right now there's no, uh, to our knowledge, there's, there's no Assembly of God church in those communities, many of them, and, uh, and many of them no full gospel witness, and, and some of them no evangelical witness. And so apostle, prophet, we speak prophetically. I'm not going to hang out there. Um, evangelist. You know, I, I think that the Holy Spirit would still call people to be evangelists, but we're not seeing that evidence. We are not seeing evangelists emerge from our fellowship. There's a problem. There's a disruption, and there's a disconnection. I, I pray, that, would you make that a point of prayer in your devotions? that God would raise up not just somebody who has the tagline, evangelist. We need evangelists who not only evangelize but also reproduce themselves so that the local church is resourced with an evangelistic witness. We need that. If we're going to disrupt the process of chaos and, and sin and how it degenerates in our communities... We want that redeemed. We want that turned around. If we don't engage the fivefold ministry gifts that Jesus himself has given to the church yes. to give through the church, we're never going to hit a zenith with, uh, with our evangelistic ministry, with our missional purpose. Uh, pastor and teacher, of course, Mark, what a, what a great testimony about uh, your, your folks going out into the streets and and you were not essential. Does that break your heart? <laughs> yeah, you know, we're, we're still working on the omnipresence thing. If we could just be everywhere, but we can't. And so when you multiply yourself through your congregants, that's being a pastor and teacher, evangelist, that's apostolic. I mean, what are we? Well, there are times where we get to flow in any one of those currents. Yeah, and let me just mention with this that I think you not being there and being able to celebrate that, but one of the other things that you've done that's made foundational is that you are evangelistic, that people know that you're always sharing Jesus. So if you just want your people to share Jesus all the time and you never share Jesus outside the walls of a church, that sends a wrong signal. So personally, let me challenge each of us who are we developing relationships with? When I do a church planning assessment, the lowest score is on evangelism. Because I'll ask a question to, the, to, to whoever I'm interviewing that wants to plant a church and tell me, two, who are your unchurched friends? Name three of your unchurched friends. Think about that right now. Can you name three? Here's what normally happens. They name family members. They name friends they went to high school with that they talk to every once in a while on Facebook. But when I asked them the question, when was the last time you sat around a table with somebody and had a meal with somebody who was unchurched as a friend? And, and I'm telling you, it's, it's quiet in that room. And then I'll ask this other question. I'll say, when was the last time you were at a gathering where they asked you if you wanted a beer? Isn't that a crazy question? Now, let me also say, if they answer they can name one, I'll say, did you take the beer? Did you drink it? That's another issue. That tells about, you know, your credential application and, you know, your integrity there. But, uh, you know, when we look at that, here's what I find, is that um, many of our circles are all sanitized with a lot of Christians. And we need to be in circles where we look across the table and we're with somebody like you mentioned and, and you're always doing that. So that's just that one piece on the evangelism piece. And so I know we're still working through that list of fivefold ministry. So, Pastor Don, I kick it back to you. Well, and we're, we're coming to the, the close. Uh, with that, please understand that in, in this disruption of a, a moment in time that we're living in, look at the three major disruptions. We have social justice, coronavirus, and a presidential election. There are opportunities 
for the church to bring Jesus to the moment. Yes. And I'm afraid we're waiting for it to be over so that we can get back to normal. Dear God, help us. Yes. Because we are called to the context. Yes. And that's the context we're in. Yes. And there's a great opportunity for altar calls during yes. coronavirus. If you're meeting in person or if you're online sharing, uh, there are people who are scared to death. And they're scared of death. Yes. And the gospel addresses that. Yes. Are we? Are we bringing the gospel to coronavirus mm. and to this moment? Are we bringing the gospel social disruption? That's a little more volatile. You're going to have to be savvy and spirit-led and, and cautious about hitting landmines and not yes. being offensive. Oh, and, and please don't be offensive. Mm. Don't jump into the fray. The church has enough reasons to be divided. We don't need three more. Yes. And so we're peacemakers. Yes. And making peace with man and God. And there are moments right now that we can seize for the gospel and at least bring an invitation to come to a redemptive relationship with God through Jesus. That's awesome. That's great. Thank you, Pastor Don. So, Mark, I'm going to ask you this question on just in terms of how can, a, how can a church or ministry that just says, you know what, we, we've kind of gotten away, we've drifted from our mission, we need to get back on track again. So what, what would that look like for, how do you keep your church to stay missional? Yeah, I, I, I read a, a scripture here real quick in Exodus 19, uh, verse 5. It says, now if you will listen to me and carefully keep my covenant, and he, he keeps going, but I think we need to listen to the Holy Spirit, mm-hmm. like, there's a million in things we can choose to be missional, right? But what is God calling us to do? I touched on that a little while ago. But so we, this thing about going out with little tents, we didn't, we just did it. We saw little white tents and we put little white tents and gave people free water, right? But people started rushing because they thought that we were selling phones. You know, so in my context, it worked well. People still come up. Now they kind of know who we are, but initially they're like, oh, phones. And then it, you can start talking to people. We give them free water. We love on them. And so what does God have in your community, right, for your church, your neighborhood? Maybe it's not a white tent, but what is it? And, and, and listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit, because there's a million and one ideas that the Lord wants to birth through you guys, yes. right? Uh, and so now it's getting cold, and we said, well, what are we going to do now? And our folks are like, we're going to go to the mall. We're gonna, we said, well, listen, and we just started listening. Holy Spirit, what do you want? And we feel led now to, we felt, as pastors, we felt Hey, why don't we pray? Why don't we pray in people's houses? That's how we started our church, and praying. And when we announced it to the church, we had about seven people just say, we, we already felt that. We want to pray in our homes, so we're going to start praying in the homes for the yes. winter. You know, and we feel that, and invite people who are not believers, right? Friends, mm-hmm. families, and I'm believing out of this. Maybe campuses are birthed. I don't know. Yes. But we're just trying to be obedient to the Holy Spirit, and I think we have to go back to that basic uh, simple, un, uh, uh, it's not complicated. Mm. You know, I think keep it very simple, let the Holy Spirit, and if you miss it, you miss it. You just get back up. It's okay. That's great. Really good. Thank you. Well, you know, when I hear Gary and I hear Mark, I'm like, God, I want that fire. I want to be, I want to be a missional. How many of you want to be a missional disruptor? I want that. And so what I've asked is if they would actually lead us in prayer, and I'm going to ask, um, almost, if, can we stand together? And, and as we stand, um, I'm hungry for this. I'm hungry for this. And, and with this, I, I just kind of, I ask them, if we can pray a prayer of impartation. Again, I don't know if that's okay to even say that, but I just, I want that. And, and I want it under my context for my community. And so right now, Gary's going to lead us, Mark's going to lead us, and let's just, let's, just, let's just reach out to God and let God just fill us and speak to us with a freshness. Let's pray, church. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Thank you, God. you Lord. We want thank this, you, Lord. Father, in Jesus' name, I just thank you for the awesome privilege you give to us, the call you give to us to partner yes, with Lord. you. And I pray specifically for people in small communities, smaller churches, uh, people that look around and and they're wondering, what can I do with my limited resources? God, I pray that you would give small churches big vision. Mm -hmm. 
So I pray, God, that you would open up doors of opportunity and, and, act, and have them step through those doors using what they have, and then you supply what the next, what's needed for the next step. God, that you would just lead and guide them each step of the way, day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year. Open doors of opportunities, always keeping that context of looking for Kairos moments where they can share your love and your grace and your hope. God, do that powerful work in lives, in churches, in towns, in the name of Jesus. And Holy Spirit of God, we just honor you, Lord, in this place and thank you for your presence. <sighs> Lord, that, Lord, we would do, Lord, what you're asking us to do, God, and not what we. <laughs> want to do, God, but that we would, Lord, focus and fix our eyes on you. Holy Spirit of God, I just pray, Lord, for our cities, Lord, that are in such a huge need, God, filled with uh, lies and, Lord, witchcraft, Lord, and so many things that people are looking for, God, but not understanding, God, that, Lord, you are the answer. God. So we pray that over our cities, over our state, our nation, Lord. I pray, God, for the churches that are represented in this house today, God. I pray, Holy Spirit, that we would begin to listen, listen, God, to what you are calling us to do, God. It's already there, God. We just have to walk in it, God. So I pray for supernatural faith in men and women and young people, Lord, and children, Lord, uh, in this fellowship, God, that we would rise up, God, to the occasion, that we would, Lord, not run from it, but run towards it, God, in the name of Jesus, that name that continues to be above every name, God. And we honor you, Lord. We thank you, God, for what is about to happen, Lord, as we leave this place encouraged and filled, God. Oh, God, that the fivefold ministries, Lord, would flow, Lord, through your church, God. Like never before, what we saw in the past pales in comparison, God, to what you want to do, God, through us, God. Now, now, God, now, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, how we need you today, Lord. We honor you, Jesus.
in your own words. God, let your favor rest upon us. God, let us be in tune with your spirit. Come on, lift your own words, lift your own worship, your own warfare. God, in our communities. God, an impartation of your spirit, an impartation of your presence. His favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May his favor be upon you.
so if we go back to Genesis chapter 12, God promised to bless Abraham. To what end? So that he could retain the blessing of God? Not at all. That through you, he said, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. So we love that song. The Lord bless us and keep us, make his face shine upon us, be gracious to us, and give us peace. To what end? So that we could retain it, contain it? It can't be contained. It has to be shared. That's the mission. So as we prepare to end this moment and go to breakout sessions, let me give you this challenge. We're a ministry family. And it doesn't matter what the title is, what the function is. If it's working with children or working with youth, or working with men, working with women, working as a lead pastor, working as an executive pastor, if, if our call is to lead in worship, we all share a same mission, don't we? And so here's the challenge. In your circle, in your ministry circle, those that are closest, uh, most closely connected to your to your leadership, your follower leadership, because we're followers first, then we lead. Who are you discipling to be missional? Is your worship team missional? Come on, say a good amen. It's more than just music. We're on a mission. Your, your kids' ministry team, are you reaching kids and families? We're on a mission. Your youth ministry team, youth and their families and their friends, would you pray with me? And let's ask God to fill us with his Holy Spirit so that his kingdom come, his will be done in our communities just as it is in heaven, in our churches just as it is in heaven. Father, we need you. We want to please you. We are excited to be partners with you. I pray, Lord, as we leave this session, that God will be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. We'll be filled with the fullness of your Spirit to go and make disciples, to bring people who are far away close to Jesus. We think of our neighbors, our church members. We think of our family and our relatives. God, use us as leaders, as examples, as followers of Jesus. Lord, we'll give you the praise and the glory. Bless us, we pray, so that we can be a blessing wherever we go. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen, amen. Give the Lord a praise offering. Thank the Lord. There are so many folks to thank. Thank you for being here. Our online friends, thank you for joining us for these, for these moments together. I want to thank Mark Geddes and the, uh, the sound team for doing a great job. Thank you. Josh, thank you, worship team, for being a blessing to us. Yeah. Again, the folks from the University of Valley Forge who are helping us with our projection, thank you. And I don't know if she's here, but somebody I forgot to thank earlier is Danielle Debley. That's Tom's administrative assistant. She has just helped us with registration and so many pieces. Thank you. And again, thank you. Thank you for taking the time out of a busy schedule. And uh, you know what? Uh, I was talking with...
Peter Greer yesterday. I think we blessed him. He was glad to be in the room with people who have skin. You know, he said this is the first speaking engagement he's done live since March. So thank the Lord for this, and th let's just say thank you to the Lord for his goodness to us. Thank you, Lord. Bless your name. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. And uh, uh, I hope you'll stay for the last series of workshops. God bless you. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand under your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand under your love. Oh, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand under your love. Yeah. Come on, sing that again. My fear. Oh, my fear. Doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Come on, one more time. My fear, hey. In my fear. Doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Oh, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Oh, my fear doesn't stand.